people are talking. We've just got a, one, one thing we've got to uh, say, just a thing about here, just a short remark, about the evidence for the Book of Mormon. They talk so much about archaeological evidence and so forth. That always comes up where the Book of Mormon is mentioned. If you want proof of the Book of Mormon, of course, you must go to the Old World. You won't find it in the New World. You can see why. There we have legible sources. We have massive sources. Do you remember the first book, the very vitally important first book of Nephi, takes, all takes place in the Old World. It doesn't take place in, in uh, Central America or anywhere else, except in the Old World. And, of course, New World archaeology won't cut anything because it covers this vast area of the Western Hemisphere. We have only an infinitesimal sampling. Nobody knows what was going on a thousand years ago in this hemisphere. I have the vaguest idea. <laughs> and uh, moreover, archaeology gives no specific answers anywhere. A anyway, you see, you, ha you have to speculate about them. The greatest a archaeological pro progress and, uh, and programs for centuries were in Egypt. That's where they started digging already in the Middle Ages because it fascinated them. So for hundreds of years, archaeology has been at work in Egypt <laughs> 20 years ago. Everything we found out about it was thrown away. See, they built up, through the years, they had built up a, a standard and accepted uh, account, the uh, approved school solution of what happened in Egypt, how the kingdom of the north and the south, they conflicted and so forth, and then they came together and, and were united in the, in the crowds. That isn't so at all. All the things we regarded as basic, not all the things, but things which we regarded as the most basic of Egyptian history for, for a century, the result of the ages of archaeology and immense expense don't hold up at all anymore. So this is where we go. Don't think that's going to help us some. What are you going to do here? Well, we must get on here. And, but not until we've looked more curiously at a few things that the authors of the Book of Mormon want us to see. Now, a syllabus is a, and speaking as, uh, as Marina uh, reminds me to do, a syllabus is a list of things that uh, should be studied. And usually you end up by studying the syllabus. You study the things you have to do, and uh, you get, you're eager to get on from one point to the next and so forth. Uh, but how do you study these things in the Book of Mormon? The purpose of a teacher is just one purpose, to save the, the student's time, you see. Uh, I can save you a lot of time. Here's where we get the books on the shelf and so forth. It's to save your time. Uh, you could have discovered these things for yourselves, but it would take you much more time the St. John method, which they, a few years ago, St. John's University tried a new method of teaching in which the students was a humanistic sort of thing. They, they went through all the steps of discovery necessary, say, to discover the telescope or discover the mountains on the moon. They, they constructed an exact replica of, uh, of Galileo's telescope, and then they looked at the mountains on the moon, and then they discovered the, uh, the moons of Jupiter and so forth. And, uh, but this takes your whole lifetime. I, if it took Galileo a lifetime to do it, the best way for you to learn it is do exactly what Galileo did, but then, then you're through and you've done nothing for yourself. See, the whole advantage, the whole advantage of recording, and we get that, and notice the Book of Mormon is an epitome. We're constantly reminded in the Book of Mormon that they have cut things down, that things have been very carefully edited, reduced only to the things most vital that the authors want us to have, and it has been taken, it is a digest of a vast amount of records that they've gone through and edited for our benefit, so they're going to save us time. And uh, so I invite you to look up the things that interest you. And there'll be books in the, on reserve uh, for this class. Uh, it's foolish, but most of them, well, for the time being, will be mine, because they're the things I've been talking about. See, that's where you'll find them. <laughs> and uh, oh, there are others, but of course, the Book of Mormon itself is, is what you need to know. And this is a strange class on a strange subject. It's not like anything else. See, this is the point. It's a crash course. It's an emergency course. It's what in the Army they call a quickie course. We haven't got long to learn. We haven't got long to go. If you'd seen the newspapers this morning, it would say, great guns, what's happening now? But uh, this is so. The situation is very urgent today. It's not like it has been at other times. And, and where do you research in the Book of Mormon? And this is the point. You must research in yourself. And I'm, I'm not talking in an abstract sense. I'm talking in a historical sense here, actually. You must see yourself in the book. And that's one thing students have always been able to do. Very easy. They can find themselves in the book. The Arab students always identify themselves with Nephi. They, oh, he was their man. And uh, see, for a time when we had the point four, uh, it was President Harris who introduced the point four in the Middle East. It was a program by which we bring Middle Eastern students over here to study. Him. And BYU had a great influx of, of Muslim students from all the Middle Eastern lands. They're required to take religion here. 
the only religion they would take is the Book of Mormon, and they had me teaching this Book of Mormon class for just for Muslims, you see, and some very amusing things came. But brother, the Book of Mormon was their book, and Nephi was their hero. They were all for him. We, uh, but, uh, but you do find it in yourself. Uh, it, you can see this, it's unique, the Book of Mormon, which has been the great converter. It's been irresistible. It's, it's done more than as much as all the missionaries put together. And it's, of course, it's their, their irresistible tool because it involves the reader like no other book. You do identify with it. It grabs you, see, if you read it carefully. Even, you don't even have to read it carefully. I mean, so many people on first reading. I was just remembering yesterday, was some, something came up when the uh, when the Salmon Brothers were, were visiting us, this is back in 1950, yes, it's uh, 1950, I feel 1960, no, it was 1959. Uh, there are fifth generation Israelis, uh, eminent scientists now, one of them in charge, uh, has to do with the disposition of radioactive materials in Israel, which is a very important problem, of course, because they have to use that form of energy, they don't have much space to put it in. And uh, uh, the other, uh, teaching, I think, it may be in North Carolina now, I think, but he's moved around. But anyway, they were here for a short time. They went skiing, and John broke his leg, younger brother. And he uh, went to the infirmary here. And uh, so they were held up. And so somebody gave him a Book of Mormon, and he read it. And then he insisted the next day on being baptized. Now, here's a fifth generation Israeli. He says, I have to be. Well, he had this huge cast on his leg. Was you going to baptize him with a cast on his leg? Yes, we baptized him. He wouldn't, he wouldn't settle for anything else. He just had to be baptized. Well, that's why the Book of Mormon can grab people. They were, so far, they were fifth generation uh, Hasidic Jews, you see. And the Hasidic Judaism is the old-fashioned Judaism. And they recognized the Book of Mormon as, again, as the Arabs did, as their book. Culturally, the Arabs recognized it. But, but uh, religiously, it was perfectly clear to the Jews what this was. So he had to be baptized on the spot. And he'd never heard of it before, as far as that goes. Book of Mormon does that. And that's why the only possible test for this course, what can it be? People ask about that. It must be an essay of some sort, which you can show how the Book of Mormon has stirred you to thought and action, how it's affected you. It will be that way. Oh, the question will be worded in a subject for an essay, things like that, or, or two. Identif identification questions. Uh, they could be significant, show that, you, that we follow along, because the historic part of it is also extremely important, see, not just as evidence, but we're going to see why. We, we hope to see why this morning, if we ever get on to this. Uh, <laughs> so that's what it is. All I can do, my, I can do, is to show you how it stirs me and the things that interest me, and that's all, you see. And it's quite unfair that your work should be judged by another, that I should judge you by the way your work impresses me. Yes, they can only be judged on the quality alone. That's the way it can be. But uh, the quality is a quality is a, is a personal judgment, as Joseph Smith says. No man's opinion is worth a straw. No man's opinion is worth a straw. It's his opinion. It's his own. He's welcome to it. But you can't use it as authority. You can't use it as proving anything, in law courts or anything else. Well, they do it all the time, of course. But this is what, what we've got to grade on. And worst of all, you see, I have my opinion of quality. Now, take to le today's lesson, for example. Uh, you say, how long is it to be? In what direction will it move? And so that depends entirely on what we find out uh, from the text here. Now, considering the circumstances under which the Book of Mormon was composed, this tremendous work that has gone into it over centuries, and then uh, when an angel bothers to bring it down personally, hand it over. Then Joseph Smith risks life and limb right from the beginning because of the Book of Mormon. And telling us how carefully it's been edited with a particular audience in mind, we must assume that every sentence in it has significance for us. They can't afford to, th to waste anything. So we get going. Here's a saying of Joseph Smith I like. Oh, here's two of them. Incidentally, the things of God, says Brother Joseph, are of deep import, and time and experience and careful and ponderous thought and solemn thoughts can only find them out. And who is engaging today in careful and ponderous and solemn thoughts? Everybody is on the make, you see. <laughs> this is almost a joke today, you see, <laughs> such things going on. My mind, O oh man, must stretch as high as the utmost heaven. The saints ought to lay hold of every door, obtain foothold on earth, and making all preparations within their power for the terrible storms that are now gathering in the heavens. The angels of heaven have taken counsel together. They have passed some decisions. These decisions will be made known in their time. So the Book of Mormon is, made, is our guide for these particular times. And it's essential to know, for example, 
uh, that this was Jerusalem where it began, and it was the first year of King Zedekiah that it began. Because there we have a specific time and place. As soon as you get to the New World, it's, it's wide open. Anybody's Book of Mormon geography will go, and they just argue forever about Book of Mormon geography, which is worthless. I wouldn't touch that. I'd never have touched Book of Mormon There's no point to it, whatever. Uh, except they move north, they move south, they meet somebody, and so forth. But, uh, <laughs> but we do know specifically where this was. It was Jerusalem, and when it was, first year of Zedekiah. And this launches us on a sure footing. And we know who installed Zedekiah. Incidentally, I, I misinformed you last time when I said, uh, when I said that uh, it was Necho who installed Zedekiah. Necho installed, uh, installed Zedekiah's predecessor. This is the way it went. It was, uh, well, let me give you the, li uh, the line up here. <coughs> we'll begin best with Hezekiah, because the Book of Mormon is full of Isaiah, you know, a good part of it, and Isaiah is the great preacher. And of course, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, Isaiah. Uh, hopelessly swamps all the others as far as statistics is concerned. It's always Isaiah. So we'll begin with Isaiah and King Hezekiah because that's where the story begins with the Book of Mormon. That was way back in the 8th century, 720, when the Assyrians ascended on Jerusalem. Well, uh, Hezekiah was uh, a contemporary of Isaiah. Hezekiah's son was Manasseh. That's, that, of course, is a good Book of Mormon name. And Manasseh's son was Ammon, another good Book of Mormon name. It's spelled A-M-O-N, different interpretations in the Book of Mormon. And his son was Josiah, the great reformer. And Josiah drove the Assyrians out of Israel. But at the famous Battle of Megiddo in 609, uh, Josiah was beaten. And he was killed by Necho II of Egypt, our friend Necho II. He would change sides, you see. They wanted to get rid of Assyria. Once they had got rid of Assyria, then Necho would take over. And, uh, and uh, jo Josiah tried to stop him at Carchemish, at Carchemish and was killed. Uh, rather, ne rather, Necho tried to stop him. Josiah's already been killed. He's already been killed at, uh, at the Battle of Megiddo, 609. But just four years later, Necho, being victorious in Palestine, uh, tried, to, uh, tried to stop Nebuchadnezzar in 605 at the Battle of Carchemish, which wasn't up in the north again, not far away, and he was killed. But this Necho II uh, had installed, remember, he had, he had overcome Josiah, but he put Josiah's son, Eliakim, in as king and changed his name to Jehoiakim. This is a trick. You put your own man in and give him a new name and so forth. So Necho II did put in Josiah's son, Jehoiakim, as you'll find this in the second Book of, of Kings, of course, in the 24th chapter and 36th chapter, uh, and put his son in as uh, king with the name of Jehoiakim, made him king of Judah. But then, the uh, and he deposed his brother. Uh, well, yes, Joseph's son, and Joachim, and deposed his brother. But he was beaten by Nebuchadnezzar, I say. Then Nebuchadnezzar came in, and he deposed Jehoiakim, the one who had been put in by the king of Egypt. He deposed him, you see, and put in his place uh, Mataniah, Matoneha, who was Zedekiah. He was installed by Nebuchadnezzar, no less. He wasn't installed by, by Necho of Egypt. His predecessor was, his brother was. And, and he changed his name to Zedekiah, the king did. But this is typical of the story. Zedekiah very soon rebelled against the Babylonians. He, he tried to throw, he rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, who'd installed him on the throne, and who trusts who in these days, eh? And this brings the Babylonians in, and, they, and Nebuchadnezzar comes and destroys Jerusalem. That brings him into Jerusalem in Lehi's time, because he had, uh, because Zedekiah had turned against him, and uh, in the first year of Zedekiah is when Lehi has to leave Jerusalem. This is quite a while before, because only 587 that Jerusalem is destroyed. So, this mix-up here is typical of what's going on. Now, uh, this, as we mentioned before, in this, six, this great time, year 600, the pivotal year, uh, everything turned on its hinges and you have a to an entirely new world. The sacral kingship went out of the window and uh, there was revolution everywhere. And suddenly, at this moment, suddenly, the founders of most of the world's great religions appear. They're all strictly contemporary with Lehi. Now, this is on reserve, but this is on this approach to the Book of Mormon. And we have a chapter on this. We can, uh, 
read some things from here. Oh, this is 44 we have in a second. And here they are. We talk about it here. Yes. Lehi counts among his contemporaries not only the greatest first names in science and politics and business, but also the most illustrious religious founders known to history. Gautama Buddha, Confucius, Lao Tse, Rahman Mahavira, the founder of uh, Jainism. We had a Jainist in the class a while back. Zarathustra, Pythagoras, the top men, they were never exceeded. They founded these religions. So you can see it is going to be a new world. And uh, they were all contemporary with Lehi. Did they know Lehi? This reminds us of another situation. See, in Lehi's day was when the seven wise men lived. The Greeks uh, talk about the seven. They were all contemporaries of Lehi. These were wise men who had been rich and successful in the manner of Lehi and all left their homes to wander in the world lo looking for wisdom. And uh, they, all sorts of stories about them. Once a year they would come together at a banquet and feast and share their ideas and their discoveries and so forth. They were seeking only for wisdom. They were the Sophoi, the wise men. And they were succeeded by the Sophists who were phony wise men who completely took over the scene a little while after by, de by cultivating the art of rhetoric. That's, that's something else. But they are contemporary. We talk about the other man. Who is the first great name in Western science? Well, we should put these names on the board, I suppose. Well, it's Thales. Thales of Miletus, and uh, we know he was contemporary because he predicted the solar eclipse of 585 when just two years after Jerusalem was destroyed. That makes him just 15 years after Lehi in the prime of life had left Jerusalem. So they were Thales of Miletus. His mother was a Syrian probably Jewish, you see, and he uh, had studied most in Egypt. His ideas were, see how international everything is, was Egyptian, and he, be, he is the father of modern science. He goes back to Thales in mathematics and his geometry and so forth. Let's see if we have something to say about good old Thales here. The, uh, yes, another who visited the East on business in Lehi's day was Thales of Miletus, father of Western philosophy and science. Mother was a Phoenician. He was educated in Egypt. Well, the story of that, uh, that Aristotle tells about him and so forth. But here's another contemporary of Lehi. He probably knew Lehi because remember he was in business. He, uh, he says that he uh, didn't have much money. He traveled around uh, and uh, he visited. Well, his I say his mother was a Phoenician, so he would certainly, Sidon was the principal Phoenician port, Tyre and Sidon. So naturally he would, he would visit Sidon and Tyre on business. And who visited Tyre on business and Sidon especially on business? What's the favorite? Name, city name on the river in the uh, Book of Mormon is Sidon. Remember the, the, the river Sidon is their, is their river, it's their outlet to the sea and so forth. So they name it after Sidon, as colonists always do, name things after places back home. And I'd be willing to bet a dime to a donut that, uh, that uh, Lehi and Thales were friends because Lehi was in the business too through Sidon. He uses it and uh, traveled a great deal about it. And, uh, had a great fortune, many, many precious things and so forth, and gold and the like. So these things, everything comes together just in Lehi's time, and this is very important for, for our world too. And, and you notice everyone, I said these, these religious founders, I suppose I should put their, their names on the board, you know about Buddhism, Gautama Buddha, the largest religion in the world and so forth, for, for membership and the like, and Mahavira and, uh, and uh, Confucianism, which is a philosophy, Chinese and the like. And uh, naturally, Pythagoras, who's the founder of, of the, the Hermetic the cults and so forth, from, from Egypt. They studied in Egypt. They start there. And it all, it all comes out of Egypt, too. And the same thing as Zarathustra. Uh, it's been shown in the last generation, that, uh, especially by Professor Yeager, that Zarathustra was the principal inspiration of Plato, and Zarathustra the Persian, you see. But he was an Eastern, had a tremendous reputation everywhere. Everybody was traveling around at this time. See, everybody was uprooted. Everybody was deraciné, and so Lehi's family is going to go through the same sort of thing. Now, uh, as I say, they were religious. Now, this is an important thing, because uh, you're not going to get a new religion unless you get a new way of life. It's a new culture. And whenever you get a new religion, you also get a new script, a new writing, and so forth. Sanskrit emerges at this time, Sanskrit and Hindu. At this time, well, why? What is Sanskrit? Sanskrit is Aramaic writing. Well, I thought they were writing. Aramaic was the international writing at this time. That's the records you find, whether you find them in Egypt, whether you find them in, in Asia Minor, whether you find them in Babylon. They're written in Aramaic. But this uh, Sanskrit is an adaption of Aramaic characters. And the same thing, Hebrew and hieratic and hieroglyphic. Hiero means sacred. It's a sacred writing was invented for religious purposes to be used in the temples only 
the hieroglyphic was. And then when Christianity came along, the Egyptians didn't keep it in line, they changed to Coptic, though they had a good uh, reformed Egyptian in Lehi's time, which was demonic, they changed to Coptic, which, which kept 14 Egyptian characters, uh, but they used the Greek alphabet, and it was to have, have a special religious uh, significance using this. It was a religious alphabet, Coptic, and of course, recently we've discovered a great deal of Coptic, we have a good collection of Coptic here in Coptic Library. The nice thing about Coptic is it's, it's very easy and pleasant to learn, whereas Egyptian isn't. And the Celtic languages with their various, and the, the Ogham, Ogham writing of Central Asia, and the runes of our Nordic ancestors, all invented strictly for religious purposes, and uh, the Estrangila and the Masnad of the Arabs and so forth. And Edward Meyer says the most significant contributions the Mormon ever made was the invention of the Deseret alphabet, Brigham Young Deseret alphabet. I have half a dozen books in Deseret alphabet. I couldn't find them out in the garage or somewhere like that. They're very interesting. It was a very good alphabet design, but notice when you have a new religion, you separate yourself. You become, as a, as a mark of distinction, you have a new alphabet. And for a while, all our school books here, including BYU Academy, were published in the Deseret alphabet. And it's, it's quite a fantastic alphabet. It's quite a good one, though. It works very well. Or you think of Silas John, who in 1904, he was a, an Apache, sure how Apache, invented an alphabet for them to preserve their sacred records in. And it was a very good alphabet, and they still use it. But oh, it's a secret alphabet. See, all alphabets are supposed to be secret. All reading is supposed to be secret. And uh, urine and thumb is something special that way. We talked about that yesterday. And so, and also you found out, remember we we uh, showed you here this uh, Meroitic. When the priests of Thebes fled south and then had to flee farther south, I think I got one of them in here, no, I didn't, and then had to flee farther south, they took, uh, oh, here it is. They invented, oops, the Meroitic script, and this is it. And here it is compared with the characters in the Book of Mormon. They had their own characters, you see, very much like Meroitic, from, derived from Egyptian, so a reformed Egyptian, and uh, <coughs> The, again, in the Book of Mormon, they have their own characters. It's a good deal is said about that, that they, uh, they have their own writing. And of course, the, the Jaredites had their writing too, which uh, was translated by King, King Mosiah. Well now, at the center of every culture then is religion. Every culture is religious. And this again is a new discovery. Civilization does not go without religion. There is a new book out by, uh, by Schurz, uh, yes, by, uh, Herbert Schertz, a German, uh, at Yale University. He's, they made a very careful study of all the cultures of prehistoric Europe. And the book concludes by saying this. <coughs> well, well, Herbert Schertz, S-C-H-U-R-T-Z. I was going to put a lot of things on the board, but I haven't put anything yet. Uh, he says, from, this, from the material evidence surveyed, culture appears to be a collective attempt at providing answers to the questions posed by man about his position in this life and the next. We always, the theory was, of course, the, the Darwinistic, Marxist, and so forth, and capitalistic theory, that it's a practical economic thing, that uh, the civilization and everything else came in response to an economic need, to a need for food, a need for clothing. That wasn't it at all. The thing that comes first is to know where you are and not feel lost. He says the thing, the evidence is to provide the answers. Every culture appears to be a collective attempt to provide answers. These questions about your position in this life and the next, not where will you get the next meal, as, as Aristotle says, the, the, uh, the mice and the, and the cockroaches and uh, the bees and the lice, they've all solved the economic problem. They all are able to live from day to day and from generation. Some of their species are thousands, millions of years old, but they're still going. They're not very bright, but they've solved their economic problem. That isn't the problem. He says, U to zain, ala to zain. Our purpose is not to stay alive, but to live as you should, live well, you see. Just to, it doesn't mean live it up either. <laughs> he, follows, he follows Socrates' dictum, the unexamined life is not worth living. But see, the idea isn't to stay alive at all. That's what, not what we're here, that's not going to satisfy. And when people satisfy themselves with that, the great Book of Mormon theme, of course, they're always saying, well, we've got all we need, and, and everything goes to pot. So he goes on, as long as the people thought they could answer that question, the culture remains stable. If it collapsed, it was because of the lack of intellectual and spiritual, mythical, if you will, a foundation for a culture's general view of the world. And so, uh, and here is a very recent statement by one of the very most eminent uh, British uh, nuclear physicists, J.G. Taylor. He's, he ends his book called Black Holes. He says, 
We may live and die without raising our eyes to the heavens, secure in the safety of our cotton wool globe. Not so safe now. Yet that is false. We cannot divorce our lives from the basic problems of the universe. Whatever we do, we must come to terms with the infinite before we can act. The wish for survival in one form or another after this life is absolutely essential for our existence. You, you're not going to have it without religion at all. I mean, it's going to be empty and people are going to become irresponsible, wild, sour, and negative, and you're going, well, we're going to get to that in a minute. So, uh, it happens in one case. Now, I want to mention, since we, start, we mentioned that idea of evidence in archaeology, one thing that's very important here, in this particular regard, uh, the general nature of the ruins found in Central America and elsewhere. Robert Heiner Gelder, I notice we have his book here, uh, on Reserve, Robert Heiner Gelder. He's worked many years. He started out is studying the uh, archaeology of Southeast Asia, the great temples, Angkor Wat and so forth. And, uh, <coughs> and then he saw the great resemblance to those in Central America and he became an American archaeologist and started comparing them. And then he went back to the Near East and compared them. And uh, he calls attention to the often stunning resemblances, and you've noticed this yourself, between the exotic remains of Cambodia, India, Mexico and Guatemala. They look very much alike. Now, we should be showing you slides like crazy here. But you've all seen the pictures of these. Should we draw a picture of one of these towers? <coughs> uh, about the, the, uh, the stupas and so forth of India. The impressive number of Chinese elements in Olmec. The tiger cult, the bronzes, the jade carving and so forth. Very Chinese, you see, Asiatic. And today I noticed the American uh, Archaeologists have shifted everything now to Asia. Everything is from Asia. Well, we know it's from Asia, but the cultured Asia, cultured Asiatic is not those primitives that crossed the, the Bering Strait and when it was frozen or when it was a land bridge. That's not it at all. Now they, they come with a full-blown culture from Asia, and everything is Asiatic here. The tiger cult, the bronzes. Contacts must have been by sea, not directly. We're quoting him now. Uh, well, here. Here we're quoting M.D. Coe, who is the foremost American, right? the one who's always sounding off on this subject, you know, back at Yale. He's, no, he's been here. He, the Mormon, we've had students with him and so forth. He says, many have noted the great ceremonial centers of Mesoamerica are highly reminiscent of Angkor and Khmer civilization of Southeast Asia. Then we show that Robert Heine Gelder, he got, got very interested and started comparing them in a big way. And he says, contacts must have been by sea, not directly across the Pacific, however, but using uh, the Kurosho Drift following the Great Cirque by the Northern Route, the uh, Japan Current, as we sometimes suggested for the, the Jaredites. Uh, Quickenberg has a book on that. Instead. But there's something seriously wrong here. For the whole Southeast Asian complex, should we draw a map? It doesn't arise until the 9th and 10th centuries after Christ. It's a thousand years after the Nephi Nephites disappeared. Uh, what are we going to get here? See? Then, he says, uh, so they could not have inspired the American cult centers built a thousand years earlier. Crickenberg says on page 572, he says, the only explanation is to look for a common source somewhere. They look alike because they came from the same place. And which, which uh, Heine Gilder finds in the Near East at a much earlier time, of course, both in its American and its East Asiatic forms. They're both brought from the Near East. America did, and that's why they look alike, and they got from the same center, and it was the Near East. And that happens to be where the Book of Mormon people came from. <laughs> but now this is the thing I was getting at about the culture and religion and so forth. If the people came from Asia, there's a puzzling lack of cultivated plants, Asiatic cultivated plants, domestic animals from the Old World in the New World. An absence of the la in the latter, the absence of the plow, the potter's wheel, the bellows, the, all the essential elements of culture they should have brought with them. The plants, as I say, and the animals, domestic animals, the plow, the potter's wheel, the bellows, glass, iron, stringed instruments, the true arch, they didn't bring any of that with them. What's wrong? Well, they did bring something entirely different with them, and this was it. And why these places look so much like, notice, they're ceremonial centers. There's a religious center in everything. This is more than... This is more than outbalanced by the more important cultural items such as political patterns, cosmology, art, religion, symbolism, ceremonial, architecture, they're alike. Far too much alike in the two hemispheres to be explained by the recent and far-fetched theory of convergence. How to explain a superabundance of one type of cultural equipment along with a complete deficiency in the other kind of stuff. Well, it's the kind of people that made the migration, that's it. So this is what Heine Gelden concludes here. 
The solution is the type of migration indicated. The people who crossed the sea were not artisans or technicians of the kind that were cultivating all around the, uh, spreading all around the Mediterranean at that time. We have their poems, their diaries, and so forth from Lehi's time, the great time of colonization, you know, <coughs> business expansion, and so forth. No, these were people of a religious and intellectual, a priestly persuasion. What is indicated, according to Heine Gelder, is, quote, a carefully planned and prepared undertaking, primarily with missionary goals, a religious group of people that fled across the sea. That's why they have these, that's what their centers are. And you see, what was the first thing Lehi did when he landed? He built a replica of the temple. It says smaller, he didn't have as much expensive stuff in it, but it was, he said, they planted that Near Eastern culture right here as soon as they got here and made a replica of Solomon's temple, as the Jews were doing at the very same time uh, from the middle of the 6th century, uh, when Ju Jerusalem fell, we know now from ample records, uh, from at Adelfantine, Adelfantine far up the Nile at the first, at the first cataract, we find, was found in 1925, oops, the Elephantina Hebrew text. There are a lot of Hebrew writings. There were letters, letters from people living down there, soldiers and people who'd fled from Jerusalem and were living way up the Nile, and they write to the elders at Jerusalem asking for permission to build a temple there, and they did. So this is the practice. Going way up the Nile, that's where you get your Meroitic and so forth. So these things uh, show some strange relationships. And there, he says, um, but why... <coughs> But then why no trace of Southeast Asiatic re religious teachings in America? Why no Hinduism and Buddhism? The answer again is to look for the Near East. When the Spanish priests and Puritan divines came here, they instantly recognized the Old Testament and the New in the teachings of the Indians. Not, nothing of, of Eastern Asia, but much the same sort of thing. So it's a, an interesting cultural pattern we have here in the Book of Mormon. Now, uh, <coughs> In Lehi's day, we said before, the barriers broke down. It was wide open. It was another swarming time. Samuel Noah Kramer has written the best, I think, the best study of that, a monograph on <laughs> the swarming time. Uh, in the year 3000, in the year 1700, in the year 1200, 700, everything turns, you see, 700. 300, 300 AD, 800, that's when the Vikings and so forth, 1200. Well, I've written a number of articles on that. And when we get to the to the Jaredites, as we surely shall in a couple of weeks, naturally, they're just at the end of the Book of Mormon, understand. Uh, we talk about that sort of thing. But this is what happens when it breaks down, you see. Uh, the, uh, every, you see, it's a matter of survivors. Everybody scatters. They move as tribes, but they move as individuals. Things break up. It's a heroic age. We saw everybody, Gyges financing a Persian on one side, Greeks on the other, and so forth. Uh, Croesus, uh, is is buddy buddy with Greek tyrants and so well uh, Gyges it was Gyges the tyrant the rich man who uh, who financed uh, who financed Necho II uh, who uh, who beat the uh, well who was beaten but who who installed uh, the king Jehoiakim you see there and uh, he was also supported by Pisistratus the uh, tyrant of Athens at that time we'll mention him in a minute I think we have time for that. Now, just a second. So we say the barriers broke down. Well, this mixing up, remember, Pianchis, Chesnikins, Nubian, Libyan, Asiatic, Amu, everything all mixed up. You'd find any, any, it was international. You'd go to any city and it was metropolitan. You'd hear all the languages spoken in the same city from everywhere. Uh, not Greek dominating, Ara Aramaic dominating, but uh, Greek is moving in on them, you see, going to take over. And it was a time of the self-made merchant kings. <coughs> 26th dynasty, that's what, the, that's what the family of the Pisistratids were. They were self-made, well, I don't mean uh, the Semiticus, <coughs> self-made merchant kings. And everything was up to sale for the highest bidder. The world was colonies, people scattering. We have their recollections. Uh, the Phoenicians at this time founded Carthage. You see, that you all know the story of Dido from Aeneas. She founded Carthage. They went forth at 800 AD. But then her sister Melissa, uh, then they, Carthage became a center for founding colonies all over, and this is what it, uh, led to the Ro war with the Romans. We were expanding at this time, and the destruction of Carthage. Because everybody was expanding, everybody was grabbing the best possible places they could. So we have some very vivid accounts of what went on by eyewitnesses, uh, Carchilicus and so forth. And so we have these personal remarks from the lyric poets. Now, so... Uh, Things are stirred up in Palestine all the time, and they're, they're, and they're mixed and blended. And uh, we talked about these great individuals. Now the point is, 
Where is security? Who is in charge around here? We talked about tyrants. Anybody who could get the power, it was his. But who wasn't corruptible? Who didn't have a price? What, who could you count on? There are just two men we think of that you can count on, two great men, and they, again, probably knew each other, and they were Solon and Lehi, the immortal Solon. Solon left Athens, well, in 595, five years after Lehi left Jerusalem, and for the same reason, the great Solon. You see what we know about him. We talk about the, the seven wise men. Well, Solon was always considered the wisest of the seven wise men. And he became Archon of Athens in 600. So this, this of course, makes him, puts him right in the same, the same bracket with Lehi. And moreover, his family had lost their wealth. He was too honest. And, uh, and he went into the business of olive, no, trading in olive oil and pottery. And he would sail back to the Levant and visit places like Sidon. And, uh, and uh, he loved to travel. And he gave, uh, he's called Solon, the wisest one. Remember, it used to be common in the newspapers to put, uh, uh, to designate uh, members of Congress and the Senate as Solons. There's real irony in that, because Solon is the great Oh, incidentally, we mustn't mention and forget this. He is the father of modern democracy. He gave us the first democratic state, and it stuck, you see. He gets the credit for being the great Solon, the wisest of the Greeks, and, uh, and the founder of Western democracy, as far as that goes. So here we get Solon and Lehi, and uh, what a man this Solon was. Now, I was fortunately able to find the library. We don't have this book. Uh, this is by my old teacher, Professor Linforth. I'm going to just quote from Professor Linforth's uh, introduction, and then some of the poems to show what the situation is. And this is the situation in Jerusalem, this is the situation in uh, Athens, and it's the situation today here. Solon himself, in the long of his extant poems, gives us an account of the principal occupations of the men of his time. Yes, he has one of those poems here. I had this all fixed up last night, but this is a shortcut, so I'll use it in the interests of time. He shows us the trader, the husbandman, the artisan, the minstrel, the prophet, and the physician. A busy, bustling world, it seemed to him. This isn't the ancient world at all, you see. This is the modern world. Uh, in which all were working blindly with little thought of the future. Money-making, he tells us, filled men's minds. Everybody wanted a career. In his day, a deep social and economic unrest pervaded the society as a result of unequal distribution of wealth. Society felt in the, fell into two conflicting classes. One was composed of the best people, the Aristoi, by which it meant the people of wealth and noble birth. The other consisted of folk at large, the demos. Political power lay entirely in the hands of the former class, and magistrates were chosen only from their number. The restlessness, however, of the lower classes seems to have been due not so much to political inequality as to cruel economic conditions. And Solomon was a member of the aristocracy, and we go into his genealogy here. It appears that early in life, Solon embarked in commerce. He was forced to do this, according to Plutarch, by the impaired state of the family fortune. As I say, he traveled east. And uh, when he, this is why he not only loved to travel, but he gave uh, Athens the ideal constitution, and nobody was willing to accept it. Each, par each party thought they were, they were shortchanged, as he, he's going to explain here. So he made a rule when he gave them the ideal constitution that he would take a trip for 10, it couldn't be changed without him. It must have his signature. And so he was, they also voted that he should take a trip for 10 years. He wouldn't come back to Athens. So he traveled for 10 years and he was on business and he was in Palestine. And he, as I say, I would bet anything that he, he knew Lehi because these were top men and they met each other all the time. Can't prove that, of course. It's a nice picture. Yes, it appears that in early life he embarked on commerce, forced to do this by the impaired state of the family fortune, which had been brought about by the excessive generosity of his father. The story of Simon of Timon of Athens. He ruined himself by being too generous. He belonged to a family which was accustomed to help others, and he was unwilling when he was in financial straits to ask aid of his friends, would not, who would have been glad to render it to him. Others found the motive for his voyage to his desire to acquire learning and experience rather than to make money. So he's one of the, tr of the seven wise men, the traveling so far. And uh, yes, he says here, Solon must have carried many a cargo of oil and pottery from his own rocky Attica to the wealthy cities across the Aegean, and in spite of his love for his own native land, must have been charmed by the brilliant society which he found in Asia. He had a wild and merry life on his, on his uh, 10 years vacation. 
So let's see what he has to say here. Well, how he got how he got to Salamis back. That got his reputation. Sometime between 595 and 590, he was elected to the archonship. You see, so this uh, puts him right in Lehi's bracket. We are told that he was entrusted with the ordinary, extraordinary powers during to do anything he wanted because both sides trusted him because of what he did to get back Salamis. They'd lost Salamis and. They'd fought it for years with the uh, people of Aegina, and they couldn't. It was the island that blocks the harbor of Athens there, that low, flat, r rocky island. And uh, they, they passed a law that anyone who should propose another attempt to take Salamis would be put to death, capital punishment. They'd had enough of it. So he put on a funny hat and pretended to be crazy. Like Hamlet, he put on an antique disposition, you see. And uh, he stood up on a, on a barrel in the in the forum, of course the Agora, not the forum, we're not in Rome, in the Agora, and uh, recited a song about getting back beautiful Salamis and so forth, acting crazy so we could get away with it. And, but people started listening to him, and he led an expedition. They did get Salamis back. So they trusted him, both sides entrusted him, when it was a deadlock, you see, between the two, and uh, made him arc and giving him absolute power. He could make any change of government he wanted, such power, <coughs> alter the whole machinery of government. By the joint, by the joint will of all the conflicting elements, the, the one man they could trust was Solon. You see, he would do the honest thing. And uh, yes, it is one of Solon's chief claims, his own claim, to glory among the Athenians of a later day, that he had been the first of the distinguished line of statesmen who had championed the rights of the people and resisted the rule of special privilege. So he was the the founder of our of Athenian democracy. Now here we are in Lehi's world. The general character of the 7th and 6th centuries is well known. It was an age of colonization, of rapidly growing. This is just the time, you see, for Lehi to set out. He would have in his baggage the whole equipment of the culture. And the, the fr right at the beginning, you remember, Nephi reminds us, he was well educated. His parents insisted that he learn Egyptian and all this. And he, so he embodied in himself. They were in a position to take with them themselves across the ocean all they would need for a new culture to get it, start, to get it launched out. But because, and this other people were doing the same thing. You see. <laughs> yeah, people, remember it was his, his day, they claim, uh, Neko, Expeditions clear, sailed clear around Africa. But this time, hundreds of colonies were being found, way up on the black, all around the Black Sea, for example, places way up north there. And so, this is the Book of Mormon. Lehi is typical here. This is just what's going on at this time. The old traditional life of the isolated Greek communities was undergoing a transformation. The old noble families embarked on new enterprises of money making. The lower classes saw opportunities for advancement, which did not depend on ownership of the soil. The masses of people began to be aware of hopes and possibilities that never before entered their heads, the American dream. The world was suddenly open to them. A spirit of adventure and eagerness for larger and fuller life marked the whole age. One single concrete thing had an incalculable influence, the invention of coined money right at Lehi's time. It has the same influence in the Book of Mormon, as you know. The fundamental transformation in human society wrought by the invention of money is sufficiently well known. The, with these general characteristics of the age in mind, we can see what probably took place. Well, he goes into this now. Uh, and so let's read what, uh, what uh, Solon himself has to say here. First, we begin with his most famous of all sayings, Gay rasko ae pola de das komenos. As I get older, I am constantly learning new things. Oh, dear. Uh, <coughs> and uh, see, getting old is a process of learning more, he says. Now, this is the situation. This is Solomon, uh, Aristotle is, is reporting what's happening here. It says, the organization of the state being such as I have described, the many were the slaves of the few, and in consequence the people rose in opposition to the upper classes. The feud was a violent one, and the opposing factions were pitted against one another for a long time. Uh, remember Ammon preaching to the, to, the people, uh, to the people met on the hill there that they had to build? They had to build the, uh, the, the sacred center, and they resented it because they weren't even able to go in because they weren't properly dressed and so forth. And then uh, speaking to the Zoramite people. In the end, by common agreement, they elected Solon as Archon to act as arbitrator between them. His elegiac poem already appeared, which begins, I am not aware, and pain lies heavy at my heart as I watch the oldest of Ionian states sinking lower and lower. And then Solon himself was a man who by birth and reputation belonged to the highest class, but his business activities and his limited means placed him in the middle class. In general, he puts the blame for the dissension upon the wealthy class. Notice this power and gain motif in the Book of Mormon here. 
And that is why he says at the very beginning of the poem that he fears their covetousness and insolence, implying that the hostile feelings which were prevalent were due to their causes. And then he says, to the common people, but he was just to both of them. He says, to the common people, I have given such a measure of privilege as suffices them, neither robbing them of the rights they had, nor holding out hope for greater ones. And I have taken equal thought for those who are possessed of power and who were looked looked up to because of their wealth, careful that they too should suffer no indignity. I have taken a stand which enables me to hold a stout shield over both groups, and I have allowed neither to triumph unjustly over the other. Now that's why, that's why he's the great Solon, you see. For he says, and here he is the four, I told you the cycle of the four steps, and here, here he puts them here in his poem. Tikte gar chorus hubrin hotan polis olbus apetai. When people are too prosperous, he says, then they begin to choke. And of course, first there's, there's uh, olbus, he starts olbus. Olbus is followed by chorus, fullness, overweening fullness, and this is followed by hubris. And then he says, just as sure as anything, you're going to get 80. Uh, this is the way Professor Linforth renders it, however. Uh, the, uh, for excess giveth birth to arrogance when great prosperity attendeth upon men whose minds lack sober judgment. Well, if that isn't Book of Mormon, I never heard of it. And uh, this is typical, you see, in a political year. They who gathered to share in the spoils entertained vast hopes. Each one of them expected to make his fortune and thought that I, though I might prattle idly now, mildly, uh, mildly now, see, uh, political promises, would reveal a nature stern enough in the end. Idle were their notions then. Now they're all angry with me and look aside with, and look at me with sidelong glances as he hasn't got a friend left because he, he was fair to both sides. Idle were their notions then. They're all angry with me and look at me with sidelong glances as at an enemy. I have, they have no reason to do so. What I promised with God's help I fulfilled. Other things I did not thoughtlessly undertake. I should find no pleasure in a thing which was achieved through the exercise of a tyrant's power nor should I be glad to see the rich soil of the fatherland divided equally among everybody. And so he, he wants to play fair whatever happens, you see. He says, the black earth, the supreme mother, is all of us. I removed the stones of her bondage, which he did, you see. He says, uh, I drafted laws which show equal consideration for the upper and lower classes and provided a fair administration of justice to every individual. An unscrupulous and avaricious man, if he had got the whip hand of the city as I had, would not have held the people back. If I had adopted the policy which had been advocated by opponents then, or if thereafter I had consented to the treatments which their opponents had already planned for them, this city would have lost many of her sons. This was the reason why I stood out like a wolf at bay amidst a pack of hounds, defending myself from attack against every side. He'd, he played fair with everybody, and the result, he's in the position of a wolf, Packs of hounds are attacking him on every side because he didn't give them what they wanted. He wanted to play fair with the others. Well, that's what happened, you see. <laughs> this is a, a famous one. For another man, see, he refused to be a tyrant, and he, he replaced the uh, tyrant Pisistratus, who is, is a friend of his, a very powerful man and so forth, but more tyranny. Uh, for if another man, he said, had obtained this office, he would not have held the people back. He would not have rested until by continued agitation he'd got the butter from the milk. But I set myself up as a barrier in the debatable land between two hostile parties. Not, that's not the one I'm thinking of here. Now here he gets, here he starts speaking like the, like the prophets of Israel, exactly. Well, it's, uh, the time is up now. We don't hear the bell here. But uh, these prophecies and this old, remember these men in Greece, they knew the prophets of Israel too, because uh, Jeremiah traveled around. Jeremiah had an independent fortune, and this, this sort of thing, you know. And, uh, he had lots of affairs. I mean, he, he had investments here and there. He had very interesting things. There was a, there was a furniture, uh, somewhat later, there was a perfume. We have the documents, office documents, of, of a perfume factory, a consortium in, uh, in Egypt uh, that had branches all over the Mediterranean, in Spain, in Carthage, in Greece, way back in Asia and so forth. And uh, Pharaoh guaranteed them protection on the sea and uh, a fair profit, and then he took his cut too. The thing is, you have, a, and there were investors in this, there were businessmen in all these places that had shares in this company. They had the, the very same sort of thing you have now. And also you had the takeovers and all sorts of dirty work too. But, uh, but you see, the Book of Mormon starts out 100% uh, with a completely authentic ring. The, the situation, the setting, if you were composing it, is that how you would have started it out, you see? Would you have put all those nice little details in? Well, uh, 
What are we now to the fourth verse of the first chapter? Oh, we're just moving right along here. <laughs>